Hello everybody and welcome to SFF 180 and night number 9 of Hallow Week 2016. Thank you all so much for joining me. I'm going to go a little bit retro on tonight's book of choice. A vacationing couple survives an avalanche on the ski slopes, only to make the shocking discovery that the resort they're visiting is oddly deserted. In The Silent Land, the World Fantasy Award finalist novel by the late Graham Joyce. Hello everybody, Thomas here, your illustrious host. As always, thank you all once again for being with me. Okay, now, as I said in the intro, I usually like to keep my video reviews to brand new or at least very, very recent titles. This title was a World Fantasy Award finalist about five years ago or so, uh, and it's by the late Graham Joyce. And while I know it's a bit of an older title, I do think that it is one worthy of your attention. It's all about Jake and Zoe, a very typical British couple who are enjoying their 10th anniversary holiday at a ski resort in the Pyrenees. And their pleasant morning on the slopes is interrupted by a most unwelcome avalanche. After digging themselves out, they notice that the entire resort is bizarrely deserted, as if in a big hurry. Fireplaces are still lit and candles are still burning. In the hotel kitchens, fresh meat still sits out on cutting boards. At first, they assume that uh, some kind of desperate evacuation has taken place. But then they discover that the entire town is equally barren of life. And after all of their attempts to leave town on their own are thwarted in bizarre, inexplicable ways, like they can't ski or drive or even try to walk out of town without their route somehow curling back and taking them right back to where they started, well, they reluctantly reach the conclusion that has already been reached by any reader who has ever in their lives watched an episode of Twilight Zone. They did not, in fact, survive the avalanche. Now, in summary, the premise of Graham Joyce's macabre story sounds like just a lazy compendium of cliches. But in execution, it's a remarkably eerie and affecting dark fantasy that overcomes the familiarity of its tropes by framing itself as a story of love and commitment, and of taking stock of what is truly valuable and meaningful in life, like the bonds we develop to our closest loved ones. Now, I liked Jake and Zoe because they weren't presented as some idealized couple, but a completely realistic one. It's all too easy in stories like this to make the protagonists more perfect and saintly than they would likely be in real life. In order to pound our emotional buttons with the cruelty and horrible unfairness of their fate. But Jake and Zoe have all of the flaws you and I have. They love each other deeply, but they keep secrets from one another. The kind of secrets that couples probably shouldn't keep, but do all the same. They tend to live a little beyond their means. Uh, in the past, there is a hint that there's been some infidelity and the, the wound is still a little raw. Their bond is as dependent on all of their points in common as it is upon all of those little moments that every couple has when you drive each other crazy. Now, I can imagine how strange it must be, you know, knowing you've died and stuck in limbo and you know, not really knowing what the next stage is going to be. For a little while, Jake and Zoe decide to live large after a fashion. They keep skiing. They crack open all of the most ridiculously expensive bottles of liquor in the hotel. They unwind in the sauna. They have awesome sex every night. But new and increasingly disturbing changes to the stasis of their environment begin to take their toll. Zoe has a secret that she's keeping from Jake because in their present circumstances, its implications would be a little bit too horrifying to contemplate. The electricity in the hotel starts to fluctuate, hence that they might not actually be alone, that something might be making active attempts to separate them begin to emerge. And then Zoe's phone rings. There are strong atmospheric scenes of creepiness and, and dread here, which given the wintry resort setting make comparisons to Stephen King's The Shining somewhat inevitable. And there are things about Joyce's story. It's foggy and remote cold setting. Uh, it's themes about redemption for the failings of love, for deep personal guilt. All of these are very similar to themes in the video game series Silent Hill. Even the title is similar, although I'm probably confident that Joyce never actually played the game in his life. But the monsters here are of a much different variety. Mostly, Joyce uses his nightmarish love story to explore the ways in which we never really truly understand loss until it has happened to us. This is a tale that gets under your skin and stays there. And while some readers might find that the climax and the denouement are maybe a little bit more uplifting than the story warrants, it does all follow logically 
from everything that has come before. Ultimately, the power of the Silent Land lies not in its creepy images of icy, empty, wind-blown streets, but from the final moments of warmth between its lost lovers. And that is all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180, everybody. I want to thank you all so much for joining me. Tune in tomorrow night for the final night, night 10, Halloween 2016, midnight central. Remember the most important thing. These are reviews you're not always going to agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit the like button, share the video, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so, because that is how SFF 180 grows as a channel. And until I see all you awesome people next time, spooky reading.